Last night, we talked through the pillars of a biblical worldview. We covered the creed that is found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5, which many scholars will argue is the earliest creed in all of Christianity. And as Paul sets the creed up for us, he says, this is the gospel. And it says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and the Twelve. And this was a formulation for the earliest Christians of what the gospel even was. But we still get that today, don't we? Have you noticed that when we sing about the resurrection of Jesus, Christians get just a little bit extra excited? Do you notice that even this, this, this morning when we sing about the stone being rolled away and that, and that tomb being empty, there's something that rises up within Christians with such excitement. And that's because our faith literally stands or falls based on whether or not that actually happened. And that's why we get extra excited. I wasn't planning on sharing this, but it just came to me during worship and I wanted to share this with you because I want you to know my heart about why the stakes are so high for me when we talk about things like progressive Christianity. Four years ago, my beloved nephew at 21 years old, who was a fairly new Christian, growing in his faith, succumbed to a moment of sinful weakness and took drugs that he did not know were laced with fentanyl, and he died that night. And it was one of the hardest, most gut-wrenching things my family has ever been through. And I sang the song we just sang at his funeral, Praise the Father, Praise the Son. And the hope that we have as Christians is entirely and 100% hinged on Jesus' dead body coming out of that tomb. Because I knew as I sang that song that although I won't see my nephew again in this life, I have the hope of resurrection, knowing that his body will be raised back to life. And if we just accept that the resurrection of Jesus is some kind of metaphor or some, maybe some kind of a spiritual resurrection, then a metaphor and a spiritual resurrection is all we have to hope for which is not much hope considering that the Bible teaches that we as human beings are an integration of body and soul. We are embodied creatures and will be embodied for eternity, either in heaven or in hell. And so if we don't have the hope of Jesus' physical resurrection, then we have no hope at all. And that is why I speak out about progressive Christianity. That is why it is so important to me to address these issues and these topics. Well, as I shared last night, the church that I had been attending about 14 years ago now would go on to rebrand itself as a progressive Christian community. And this had facilitated a faith crisis in my life that was one of the darkest and most disorienting and agonizing times of my life. But God in his faithfulness rebuilt my faith through the process of study and gaining knowledge about things like history and biblical scholarship and how we got the New Testament and if we can trust the Bible and all sorts of questions that were in that vein. And about the time my faith was restabilized, that church that I had left and been a part of rebranded itself and they said, we are now a progressive Christian community. So at that point, I began to study progressive Christianity. I began to read the books written by those who were self-professed progressive Christians and trying to figure out what they believed. And guess what? It was very difficult to figure out what they believe. Because progressive Christianity is very fluid. It's actually progressive. It's progressing constantly beyond what I would call historic Christianity, which is what we covered last night. So I want to start with maybe trying my best to define this kind of constantly fluid and constantly changing and evolving movement as best I can to help you understand the difference between historic Christianity that we covered last night and this new, well, it's really not new as we'll see, but seemingly new type of Christianity. So the best way I can describe it is that Christianity itself is progressing in the mind of the progressive Christian. In fact, I'll take you to progressivechristianity.org and their definition where they say that progressive Christianity is inherently always evolving and progressing. Of course, we know from scripture that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that his word will never pass away, that God doesn't change. And so while you and I might progress, to use that word, in our knowledge of the things of God, 
That doesn't mean that God himself or the Christian faith is evolving and changing. So that would be the first difference that I would say between progressive Christianity and historic Christianity. The other way we might think about progressive Christianity is if you think about the way Christians have historically viewed people like Peter and Paul, the people who walked with Jesus, the eyewitnesses of his life, death, and resurrection, we assign them the highest authority to tell us what Christianity is. In fact, this is why Jesus commissioned them as his apostles, and then their words would be eventually written down in our New Testament, which would have the same authority as the Old Testament. But in the mind of the progressive Christian, those earliest followers of Jesus, the people that knew him and walked with him and were eyewitnesses of his life, in the mind of the progressive, they represent Christianity in its infancy, much like a baby that's just learning to crawl before it walks. So therefore, we can look back now with this higher knowledge that we have today, and we can make corrections. This is why in progressive Christianity, it is not uncommon to hear a progressive Christian disagree with the Apostle Paul. You might hear them say things like, well, the Apostle Paul had biases, or he had prejudices that colored the words that he wrote down in the New Testament. That's why in progressive Christianity, they can look out into culture and view that as a moral evolution and then adopt the cultural idea of ethics when it comes to things like sexuality and gender because they don't see these things as fixed and eternal and unchangeable. They see these things as things that are constantly evolving and then as we evolve, we become more aware of these things as well. And so Christianity itself is always evolving and progressing. Now, I'll take you back to progressivechristianity.org. By the way, I want to tell you a little bit about that source. When I wrote my book, Another Gospel, I did not use progressivechristianity.org as one of my sources. I went to the primary sources of the books and the podcasts and the blogs written by progressive Christians. But why I like this summary from progressivechristianity.org is it's run by many high-profile progressive Christians. There are a lot of high-profile progressive leaders that will blog on that site and guest post. So there's a lot of unity within the movement about what I'm about to read you, but I'm about to read you what are the the five points of progressive Christianity according to progressive Christians themselves, because I don't want to build a straw man, which is uh, a fallacy of logic when it's kind of like if you... If you had a straw man in a cornfield, that'd be a lot easier to knock down than a 300-pound linebacker, right? So a straw man is when you just present the weakest point of your opponent's view so that it's easier to refute. I don't want to do that. I want to give you their words about how they describe themselves. Now, this list used to be eight points, and I've been saying for years that they're probably going to condense it down and get rid of a few things that were in the original eight points, and I'll share those with you as we go, but I want to read you their updated five Five points because I think this is going to give us a really good view of where the progressive Christian is coming from. So number one, progressive Christians believe that following the way and teachings of Jesus can lead to experiencing sacredness, wholeness, and unity of all life, even as we recognize that the Spirit moves in beneficial ways in many faith traditions. Now, I want you to pay attention to a couple of things that we see in this point number one. First of all, pay attention to the words experiencing sacredness, wholeness, and unity of all life. Now, in the previous eight points that stood for many, many years, the word one Oneness was spelled with a capital O, and that is also a type of idea that we find in the New Age. And in the New Age, the idea of oneness or unity of all life is built upon the worldview of pantheism. So pantheism teaches that God is all and all is God. So the, you know, the Mother Earth cults, the, anybody see the movie Avatar? That was sort of a good example of a pantheistic worldview where the the creation itself is divine. So that word pan means all, theism means God. So God is all, all is God. Now, most progressive Christians are not pantheists, but what many will admit to being is what is a close cousin of pantheism, which is called panentheism. You see that word N is put in the middle. So pan meaning all, theism meaning God, N meaning, you guessed it, in. So God is in all and all is in God according to the panentheist. And so 
both in pantheism and in panentheism, there is this idea that there is a sort of divinity in all atoms of created matter. Every molecule of created matter contains divinity. So for the panentheist, they do believe that God created the universe, but they believe that when he did, he poured his spirit into all created matter, much like a hand fills a glove. Therefore, at creation, God became, in a way, interdependent with his creation. Now, I, I wanna start with some good theology here because what good Christian theology teaches us from scripture is that God is spirit which means he doesn't have a body, he's not contained by spiritual matter, in fact, he's omnipresent, which means he's everywhere all at the same time, and if he's everywhere all at the same time, it means he can't be contained within a tree or a rock or a table or some other form of created matter, but this is a very important foundation to understand of the progressive Christian worldview, because if they're approaching creation from the idea that every molecule of created matter contains the spirit of God, well then where would you look to find God? What's the closest access that you have to created matter? Well, it would be yourself, right? And I think I will show you as we go through this talk that that is the end result of progressive Christianity, that it leads you to worship yourself. But let's move on to number two here. Progressive Christians seek community that is inclusive of all people, honoring differences in theological perspective, age, race, sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, class, or ability. Another one of the pillars of progressive Christianity is adopting the secular cultural ethic of sexuality and gender. So they're going to be inclusive of every type of ideology that is going to capitulate to the idea of sexual orientation that you can maybe change your gender, uh, that you know, your sex isn't ne necessarily attached to your biology or your, your identity as um, a biological, you know, your anatomy. But also, it's going to be very inclusive of all other religions. In fact, many progressive Christians believe that all religions are coming from and going back to the same source. This is why progressive Christians are not very evangelistic in the sense that they're not gonna be going to the Buddhist and try to convert the Buddhists to Christianity. They're not going to be wanting to share that creed from 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5 to convince the Buddhists that they need to repent of their sin and trust in Christ. Because of the view they hold, everyone has a seat at, the t at God's table. So rather than convert the Buddhist, the progressive Christian is going to want to learn from the Buddhist, want to learn what the Buddhist has figured out about God or what the Muslim has figured out about God. This is why it's not uncommon. In fact, my old church did this as well. It's not uncommon for progressive churches to invite a Muslim imam to preach the sermon on a Sunday morning because in their view, they want to learn from other religions, not to convert them. Number Number three, progressive Christians strive for peace and justice among all people, knowing that behaving with compassion and selfless love toward one another is the fullest expression of what we believe. Now, I think at first glance, most of us in here would say, well, yeah, I want to do that too. We, we want to seek justice, right? We want to uh, have lives that... that are full of compassion and love toward one another. But the one thing we have to start with as a foundation as we learn about progressive Christianity is to understand that there's a redefinition of words. So let's take, for example, that word justice. The word justice, understood from a biblical perspective, means Justice means like being fair, right? And it flows out of God's nature and character. In fact, where we have to actually start is with justice as one of God's attributes. In fact, in the Hebrew, God's justice and righteousness come from the same root word. So biblically speaking, perfect justice is God himself. And an injustice is anything that falls short of his perfect nature and character. So before we can even figure out how justice might play its way into a social setting, we have to understand the nature and character of God. And so if we see that played out, we can look at Old Testament law, we can look at some prescriptions in the New Testament and see that, that we want to be fair. We have equal weights and measures. We're not deceitful. We treat everybody fairly. Everybody has a fair chance, right? But the progressive Christian doesn't define justice that way. In fact, the progressive Christian defines justice more along the lines of a Marxist worldview, which would teach that everyone has the same 
outcome, not the same chance or the same opportunity, but the exact same outcome. This is why, for progressive Christians, theological issues cease to be theological and they become justice issues. So I'm going to take a kind of a hot topic in the church right now and and sort of apply that to this definition of justice. Let's take the issue of women in ministry. Okay, I just felt everybody tense up, right? No. Um, So faithful Christians have disagreed on this topic. I was actually raised in a church that was egalitarian, meaning they, there was no role in the church that a woman couldn't hold. I thought this was how everybody was. I didn't know there was anything unusual about that. Um, I, I know maybe here in Canada, it's a little less unusual than it is in America. But as I went through my faith crisis and God rebuilt my faith and I really studied scripture with, with a good tools of study, I actually changed my view on that. And I am now what's called a complementarian, where I believe that men and women are made equal in value you dignity and worth, but they have different roles to play in the home and in the church. Well, like I said, faithful Christians can come to the scriptures and say, okay, well, I think the Bible teaches this, and and the other one might say, well, I believe the Bible is teaching this, and we're going to debate that topic based on scripture. That would be what's called a theological belief. But for the progressive Christian, because the women don't have the same outcome as men, it's not just a theological issue, it's an actual injustice. And so you can see how theology begins to be shaped and formed by faulty definitions of words like justice. Let's move on to number four. Progressive Christians embrace the insights of contemporary science and strive to protect the earth and ensure its integrity and sustainability. It has taken me the longest time to figure out what the role of environmental activism is in progressive Christianity because I will admit to you that I'm a little bit crunchy myself. Like I really, I keep bees and I have chickens. And so environment, you know, the environment, sustainable agriculture, things like this have been things that always have been very important to me. I don't like being wasteful. I, you know, we're working on solar power at our house and moving toward that. But I realized as I studied more about this that for the progressive Christian and for environmental activists in general, it's really not about you as an individual um, trying to leave less of a carbon footprint or you know, not using pesticides on your lawn or, or something along those lines. It's an environmental activism that is motivated by a strong political bent. And, it's, tri- and it's, it's really based on the theological view that God's creation is not okay. Like it's not, God doesn't have the control or the power to withhold his creation and fulfill his plan. And so the activism, the the things you're supposed to do are going to fall very strongly in line with whatever the consensus is in secular culture, not necessarily left to the individual to say, hey, what can I do or something along those lines. So that becomes a very strong tenet of progressive Christianity. And, And I'll just add something to it as well. As Christians, we want to take care of the planet that God has put us on, right? That's kind of our job is to steward things well. But for the progressive Christian, again, this almost becomes a replacement for the gospel, where it becomes almost a works-based salvation, where you earn your points, your brownie points, by doing the activism. And that's, by the way, not just environmental activism, but all sorts of different social justice causes that are defined by culture. Number five, progressive Christians commit to a path of lifelong learning, believing there is more value in questioning than in absolutes. Now, again, I I would hope that we would all be on a path of lifelong learning and have the humility to say that, but I want you to notice that they have pitted questions against absolutes as if they're opposites. They're actually not opposites. In fact, when I ask a question, I'm actually hoping to find an absolute answer. Now, I know that not every question I ask, I will be able to find an absolute answer. There are some things, even in scripture, that are left a bit mysterious, so I won't be able to come to a concrete answer, but the The reason I'm asking the question is because I want to find the answer, but that's not the way it works in progressive Christianity. In progressive Christianity, a very high value is placed on remaining a bit agnostic on certain theological topics. So if you land on a certain position theologically, you're viewed as less enlightened. You're kind of viewed like like you're close-minded because you've sort of landed on this position. So in progressive Christianity, the point of asking a question isn't necessarily necessarily to get to the bottom of the answer. The point of asking a question is to find the next question and then to find the next good question and then to continue to become a question asker, which really promotes a culture of doubt. Now, I want to make a comment about doubt. 
Doubt is not, in my opinion, always a bad thing. In fact, I think that a mature, every mature Christian has gone through periods of doubt and maybe will continue to go through periods of doubt. But faith and doubt are not opposites. Last night, we talked about faith being an active trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Well, you, you can naturally see how doubt will bubble up within the context of faith. You believe something and then maybe somebody says something that might contradict it, so you, you have a bit of a conundrum and you say, okay, well, now I'm doubting this belief. And all through scripture, we see God being so merciful toward doubters. In fact, the book of Jude, I was just reading this morning, said, be merciful to those who doubt. Right, So when people have doubts, we want to offer evidence. This was how Jesus responded to John the Baptist. When John the Baptist expressed doubt about Jesus' identity, he didn't shame John. He didn't say, you know, you should just believe harder. He offered evidence. He offered the evidence of his miracles or his signs to prove to John that he was who he said who, that he is. So doubt is not wrong in every case, but doubt is really should be resolved. We want to try to resolve our doubts. That's the reason we ask hard questions. That's the reason we dive into our doubts. But for the progressive Christian, doubt becomes a way of life. Because if you resolve a doubt or you land on a sure position, then you have then closed your mind and then you're not an open-minded person. So it creates this culture of agnosticism and a culture of doubt. Well, with the time we have left in our session today, I want to be very practical because I want to give you tools and questions and resources that you can use to have conversations with people in your life that might be swept up by progressive Christianity. And so I wanna make a proposition to you and I wanna see if you agree with the premise of what I'm about to say. And if you do, then we'll continue. If not, we'll just take a break until the next session. No, I'm just kidding. I'm still gonna do it. But <laughs> here's the proposition. If we call ourselves Jesus followers, if we're Christians, then what we believe about the Bible, the cross, and the gospel, well, everything, but in particular, the Bible, the cross, and the gospel, should be in line with what Jesus taught about those things. Fair enough? I mean, everyone has the right to disagree with Jesus. I know people who disagree with Jesus, and you have the freedom to do that. But if you're gonna say you're a Jesus follower, that you're a Christian, then, then what you believe and what I believe about everything, but in particular, these really important topics should be what Jesus taught about those things. Fair enough? Okay, so with the rest of the time, what I wanna do is take you through sort of the Christian view of those things, then I wanna to present to you the progressive Christian view of those things, and then I wanna to go to Jesus. And the reason I'm doing that is not because I think that the rest of God's word doesn't have as high of authority as Jesus' words. In fact, I, I say all the time, all the words of the Bible are red letters because Jesus is the author, right? But for the progressive Christian, for the purpose of having these discussions, you're probably not going to get very far with a progressive Christian by quoting Paul. But you might get somewhere quoting Jesus, so I wanna give you those tools, and I hope too that maybe there's some of you in here today that might have been a little bit confused or swept up in some of these ideas, and I'm really, really glad you're here. And I understand where you're coming from because if you missed being here last night, I was in a class, a very private class in a progressive ch Christian church where all of the ideas that I believed about God were challenged by progressive ideas, and it was years of study and work for God to rebuild my faith, and some of them sound so good. They sound really loving. They sound like the thing you'd want to say to somebody when they're having a hard day or if they've been through some difficult times. But I, I want us to really remember that as Christians, we go to scripture. We are under the scripture to know who God is, who we are, what's wrong with the world, what happens when we die, what's the meaning of life, all of those big questions that so many different worldviews are trying to answer. So let's just talk about the, the basic Christian view of the Bible. The Bible is God's word. It's inspired by God. And by the way, when we talk about the Bible being inspired by God, you're all probably familiar with that verse from 2 Timothy that says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for correction, reproof, rebuke. Well, that word, that phrase in English, inspired by God, comes from one Greek word that literally means God breathed. 
So it's important we understand what we're talking about when we talk about the inspiration of scripture. We're not talking about God taking some words and making them inspiring to us. And we're not even actually talking about the authors themselves being inspired. We're talking about the words that God breathed through them onto the page. And this is why that's important. We don't say the authors themselves are inspired because they were fallible people. They didn't have all knowing, you know, God's omniscience to know all things. They probably did have some biases and prejudices and wrong information. They didn't know the end from the beginning, but God used human authors to breathe out his word onto the page. So it's the words on the page that are inspired. Now with the doctrine of inspiration, we certainly see their personalities reflected. This is how God chose to do it. We see their writing abilities, their grammar styles, their cultural contexts. God in his sovereignty chose to do it that way. And that is what we talk about when we talk about inspiration. They weren't like human typewriters that went into a trance and just dictated. God used their human writing abilities and and culture and personalities. We see those things in the text in God's inspired word that's on the page. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the inspiration of scripture. And because the Bible is God's inspired word, it's authoritative for our lives, which means we are compelled to obey it. Now there are some certain things we have to understand about reading scripture. And there are a few tools that we need to get under our belt, like one really important one is to understand that not everything the Bible records, it approves of. There are some horrific things recorded in the Bible that people did when they disobeyed God, when they went their own way. Read the book of Judges, it's quite horrific, and you get to the end of, uh, I think it's in the 20s somewhere, where it says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They weren't obeying God. So you see those stories written about that are quite horrific. You see the serpent lying to Eve. That's recorded accurately. So we have to have some tools to understand what type of a book we're reading in the Bible. Is this a book of wisdom where it's general principles of wisdom and not necessarily promises? Uh, Is this history we're reading? Is this a book of law? Is this an epistle which is instructive for the church? Who is the person who is writing it? Who were they writing it to? How did that first audience understand understand it and interpret it because it can't mean something today it didn't mean then so these are tools that we need to use when we come to the bible but understood properly we must obey god's word and that's what we mean when we talk about god's word being authoritative but in progressive christianity almost all of these things are off the table now i will say to you that progressive christians might even say they believe in the inspiration of scripture but you have to understand that they mean something very very different than what we mean when we talk about the historic doctrine of inspiration and some progressive christians will assign a higher level of authority to certain parts of the bible Uh, For example, some will uh, assign a higher level of authority to the Gospels than they will to Paul or to certain parts of the Old Testament. In fact, many progressive Christians really just don't like the Old Testament at all. And so I want to take you through a few different progressive thought leaders and what they've said about these things. Now, if this, if I'm about to say somebody that, you know, maybe you've read the book and you got something good out of it, I'm not attacking this person. I'm not, you know, saying they're bad people or that they're mean or any of that. But it's really important, like we said last night, that we have to name who is saying these things because they're saying it to millions of people and lots of people are imbibing these ideas and it's really important that we understand what they're saying so that we can answer it biblically. So I'm gonna take you first to a Harvard trained Bible scholar, Pete Enns. He's very uh, much respected in the world of progressive Christianity and in his book, The Bible Tells Me So, he wrote this. The Bible is an ancient book and we shouldn't be surprised to see it act like one. So seeing God portrayed as a violent tribal warrior is not how God is, but how he was understood to be by the ancient Israelites communing with God in their time and place. So it's very common for progressive Christians to say, you know, Moses didn't really get God right every time. Maybe Israel was looking out into culture and they saw the pagans were sacrificing to their God. So they thought, well, maybe we need to sacrifice to Yahweh. They looked out and saw their pagan neighbors declaring holy war on other countries. So so they thought, well, we need to go declare holy war in the name of Yahweh so we can show that Yahweh is the greatest. The problem is, is that's not what scripture says. 
Read the Old Testament and look and see how many times it says, the Lord said to Moses, the Lord commanded, the Lord said this, the Lord said that. If the Lord didn't say those things, then scripture gets God wrong. The stakes are that high. If Pedens is right and the Old Testament does not get God right, well, then we have no objective standard by which to say what God actually is like. The stakes are very high with holding this view of the Bible. But the main question I want to talk about in this session is, what was Jesus' view? Is that what Jesus thought about the Old Testament scriptures? As we talked about last night, in Jesus' day, they had the Old Testament scriptures. They were called the Jewish scriptures. Same words of the Old Testament you have today, arranged in a different order. But that was the scriptures that Jesus would have been appealing to when he said the scripture said. And I hope to show you just in a short time that we have that Jesus taught that the scriptures are God's word inspired by God and authoritative. I want to take a look at a passage in Matthew 15. We're going to read verses 3 through 9 together. It's important that we see how Jesus talked about the Old Testament scriptures. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. Now I want to pay attention to some of the wording here. Notice that Jesus says, why do you break the commandment of God? Now he's talking about the Old Testament. And then he says again, for God commanded, and then he quotes a passage that can be found in three different Old Testament books, honor your father and your mother. He says, this isn't just what Moses wrote. This isn't just what was written down in your scriptures. This is what God commanded. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Now, I want to pause here because what's going on in this scene is that the Pharisees were adding moral obligations to people that the Old Testament scriptures didn't require of them. And so they were legalists. This is the very definition of legalism. And Jesus said, you void the word of God when you add your traditions to the word of God. How, how dare you, basically, Jesus is saying. So right here we see that Jesus puts the words of scripture on a totally different level even than the religious leaders. Then he calls Isaiah a prophet, which is important. He says, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now pay attention to what's going on here. Jesus quotes from a, a passage that can be found in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, and he calls it the word of God. In Matthew twenty two thirty one, 31, he quotes Exodus and he says, have you not read what God said to you? Not what some scribe who was trying to figure God out in their time and place said to you, but what God said to you. Matthew twenty two forty three 43 gives us a picture of Jesus, what he taught about inspiration of scripture. He says this, how is it then that David, speaking by the spirit, called him Lord, and he's talking about the Messiah. So when David prophesied that the Messiah was going to be more than just a physical descendant, but actually calling him Lord, Jesus said, David was speaking by the Spirit. This isn't something David could have known on his own. This was God-breathed, right? And then if you want to know Jesus' view of the authority of Scripture, look no further than Matthew 4. I love this passage for so many reasons, but one of which is seeing the way Jesus fights temptation. So this is the famous scene. We all are familiar that Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and in his full humanity, he's hungry, he's tired. I did a little research about that region at that time, and it was rough terrain. There were wild animals, sometimes even roving bands of robbers and criminals. So Jesus had spent 40 days and 40 nights in this wilderness fasting and he's hungry and he's tired and the devil comes to him and says, if you're really the son of God, turn that stone into bread. And how does Jesus respond? He says, it is written. Now that blows my mind because 
I can personally think of two or three different ways that Jesus, as God in flesh, could have fought temptation in the wilderness. He could have sent the de- called a legion of angels down, sent the devil flying. He could have actually just spoken it on his own authority. He is the author of scripture anyway. He could have said, I say, and then made the devil go away. But what does he do? The living word appeals to the authority of the written word to fight temptation. That blows my mind. Jesus' view and what he taught about the Old Testament scriptures is just tremendously strong. And three times they go back and forth. The devil quotes scripture back to Jesus and Jesus all three times says, it is written, it is written, it is written. And he uses the Old Testament scriptures to fight temptation with it is written. So again, if we are gonna be Jesus followers, then our view of scripture should be what Jesus lived and taught about scripture. One of the best ways I can sum up the progressive view of the Bible is to quote a friend of mine who's an ex-progressive Christian. He actually deconstructed into progressive Christianity and then was discipled back to historic Christianity by a local pastor. And I asked him, I said, what was your view of the Bible when you were a progressive Christian? And he said, I thought the Bible was a human book about God, not a divine book written for humans. And that is, I think, the crux of the matter. But this was not Jesus' view. So as Jesus followers, what we believe about scripture should be what Jesus taught about scripture. Let's move on to the cross. We talked about our creed last night. And typically, if I ask a room full of Christians, why did Jesus die on the cross? You're probably all going to say back in chorus to me, for my sins, right? This is found in the earliest creed. This is what Christians have always believed. But for the progressive Christian, the idea that God the Father would require the blood sacrifice of his only son implicates the moral character of God. And in the mind of the progressive, this turns God into some kind of cosmic child abuser. Has anybody heard that phrase, cosmic child abuse? This is something that has been gaining popularity over the past several years. It was first popularized by a progressive pastor named Steve Chalk. And he said this, Penal substitution, now that word penal means punishment, so when you add the element of punishment and satisfying the wrath of God, Jesus dying in our place, that's what we're talking about with penal substitution. He said penal substitution is tantamount to child abuse, a vengeful father punishing his son for an offense he has not even committed. So there's a widespread denial in progressive Christianity of this idea of substitutionary atonement, that Jesus died in our place. And certainly, uh, uh, almost universal denial of the idea that Jesus was punished in our place and that he drank the cup of God's wrath, which is his righteous justice and judgment against sin. But what was Jesus' view? That's the question. To understand Jesus' view, I wanna take us to an Old Testament prophecy for context. This is a prophecy given by Isaiah, which remember Jesus called Isaiah a prophet. And this came about 700 years before Jesus. And theologians refer to this as the suffering servant passage. And it's found in your Bibles in chapter 53 of the book of Isaiah. Now I'm gonna read you a few passages from Isaiah 53. But I wanna encourage you all, if you've never read Isaiah 53, go home tonight, find a quiet place, carefully and slowly read Isaiah 53 because this is a prophecy about the coming Messiah. And we're gonna see if this predicts that this coming Messiah will die in our place, take punishment upon himself, take our sins upon himself. Let's read a few passages from Isaiah 53. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Now chastisement has to do with punishment. That's punishment language. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And iniquity, transgressions, these are words that mean sin. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, 
make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Now, notice that accounted righteous, that's accounting language, that's debt payment language. So his righteous accomplishment will be put into the account of many. He poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So the million dollar question is, did Jesus teach that he was that guy? Because if Jesus says he's that guy, then I don't see how you could possibly get around penal substitutionary atonement because it's teaching punishment, it's teaching sins of the world being put upon him, being the will of God to crush him. He's the one who's doing this. He's putting him to grief. So if that's Jesus' view, then I don't see how we can get around it. Well, in Luke 22, we're all familiar with the scene. It's the night before Jesus is betrayed and he's gathered in the upper room with his disciples and he institutes communion. Well, a little bit later in Luke chapter 22, he says this, for I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And then he quotes, and he was numbered with the transgressors for what is written about me has its fulfillment. Now, where do we read, and he was numbered with the transgressors? We just read it in Isaiah 53. Now, lest you think, oh, well, maybe he just meant that one little part. That's not the way it works, right? This is a prophecy about a particular person who will accomplish a whole bunch of different things. And it's not like Jesus meant just this one verse, because actually the chapters and the verses weren't added to our Bibles till about 500 years ago when Bibles were beginning to be mass produced. So it's not like Jesus meant, oh, just verse whatever. No, this was about a person and Jesus saying, what is written about me has its fulfillment. Now, if that's not enough, a little bit earlier in that scene, likewise, the cup after they had eaten, Jesus said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now, there's a couple of really cool things going on in this passage of scripture, because in that context, a covenant was understood to be something that was written down. Covenant, that's why sometimes you'll hear Old Covenant and Old Testament used interchangeably because a covenant was a document that was written down. So many theologians believe that this was Jesus predicting and actually commissioning the New Testament to be written because he said, this is the new covenant. By the way, the old covenant predicted that there would be a new covenant and Jesus is saying, here it is, but this time it's in my blood. Now, if you had no context for what was going on in the Old Covenant, that might be a little bit puzzling. But because we understand that Yahweh instituted the sacrificial system with Yahweh, that wasn't something that they just looked around and copied people around them. In fact, it's my view that people around them probably did that because instinctively the law of God is written in our hearts and everybody knows that blood is required for there to be forgiveness of sins, as it says in Hebrews. But God instituted this system with Israel to make atonement for sin. There was the guilt offering, the sin offering, a lamb, a bull, a goat, sometimes birds were brought and the hand of the person would be placed on the animal to signify substitution. Then the animal would be slaughtered, the blood poured out on the side of the altar and these were sacrifices to both expunge you of your guilt for sin and to cleanse you of your sin and provide reconciliation with God. And so Jesus comes along and says, this is the new covenant in my blood. So he's basically saying, I'm fulfilling that old covenant. This is why you don't. This is why we don't have to bring bulls and goats to the, the temple to be slaughtered on our behalf because we have the final sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, which is what he's saying here. Now, for the charge of cosmic child abuse to stick, I think a couple of things would have to be in play. First, Jesus would have to be unwilling Right, because the idea is that you have this mean bully God in the sky that's just looking for somebody to punish so that his justice can be satisfied or something like that. But Jesus wasn't unwilling. In fact, we know from John 10, 18, he said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. So this, in my mind, obliterates the idea of cosmic child abuse because God actually gave the authority to Jesus to lay his life down and to take it back up again. Jesus is saying, no one is doing this to me. I'm willingly 
laying my life down. And the other, I think, thing that would have to be in play for cosmic child abuse to stick is that Jesus would have to not be God. And that's why I think the charge of cosmic child abuse is a gross misunderstanding of the Trinity. Because what you don't have is this mean, capricious bully in the sky just looking for somebody to punish. What you have is God in his perfect righteousness, holiness, and justice, knowing that there is no worthy sacrifice. So instead of pulling a hapless victim out from somewhere else, which wouldn't have worked anyway, God says, I will do it because of love. And so that's when we have the incarnation, God in flesh, Jesus living that perfectly sinless life that none of us could accomplish so that his righteousness could be put in our account when we trust in him. And that's really good news for the person who understands they need it, for the person who understands that they're a sinner. But I kind of think if Jesus were incarnate today and walking around and somebody made that statement of cosmic child abuse, Jesus would respond similarly, I think, than he did to Peter. So there was a scene where Jesus predicted his death and resurrection and Peter opposed him. He was like, no, we don't want that to happen, Lord. And Jesus turned to Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And in my estimation, in my analysis of progressive Christianity, it's a very here and now religion. It's very much focused on this life. It doesn't have an eternal perspective, that eternal hope of resurrection and spending eternity with God. It's very here and now. Like we don't want somebody to die a bloody death on a cross. That sounds awful because there's not this eternal perspective. Their eyes and their minds are set on the things of man, but not on the things of God. So if we're Jesus followers, if we're Christians, then what we believe about what Jesus was doing on the cross should line up with what Jesus taught about what he was doing on the cross. Let's go to the gospel. I love talking about the gospel because the word gospel means good news. It's the message of salvation. Maybe you guys have heard the quote. It's actually attributed to St. Francis, but St. Francis never did say this. But have you heard the quote, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words? Have you all heard that? Yeah, well, first of all, whoever said that used words to communicate that. But the gospel is a verbal message that's communicated using words. Now, certainly your actions, your behavior can draw people in to want to hear the gospel, but you doing good works is not the gospel. That is not what saves you. That's not what saves anyone. It's a verbal message of the good news of God's salvation, right? This is what we talk about. When we say, let's go share the gospel, that Christ died for my sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, right? This, this is the gospel message that we are supposed to be preaching. Now, I believe we might have covered this in the podcast last night, but some theologians will spread that out through the narrative arc of creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And I shared with you last night, and I'll repeat it for anybody who wasn't here, but progressive Christians deny all of the points along that narrative arc. So you have creation. We know that the dominant view in progressive Christianity is panentheism. Whereas in historically Christians know from scripture that God is both imminent in his creation, he's with us, his spirit fills us, right? But he's also transcendent and that he's completely other. He's set apart from his creation. He's not a part of his creation or in any way interdependent with it. Well, in progressive Christianity, almost all across the board, they will deny that there was a type of fall that affects all mankind. So like I said, progressive Christians aren't gonna deny that people do sinful things or that they even do great acts of evil. But what they will deny is that that sin separates us from God and that that sin is inherent in us. In fact, in progressive Christianity, you will often hear the doctrine of original goodness pitted against the doctrine of original sin. Sometimes it's called original blessing. And so it's the idea that you just need to realize God called you good. You just need to realize that. And so there's really no fall that happens that affects all of mankind. Well, you can see how if you don't have a fall, the rest of the dominoes of the gospel fall by the wayside. So Jesus' death, 
becomes more of him just showing us what forgiveness looks like. In fact, many progressive Christians will appeal to Jesus saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I'm so thankful that's in the scriptures because we see an example of Jesus to follow. One of the things I'm really trying to teach my kids right now, and they're not loving it, but I'm teaching them what Jesus says about loving our enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Bless those who curse you. That's a hard teaching for our sinful flesh, right? So yes, Jesus is a moral example, but he's not only a moral example. If all he did on the cross was show us what forgiveness looks like, then we're doomed in our own sin. We need that substitution. We need that sacrificial death of Jesus, but progressives will deny that his death was sacrificial. And like I said, they're split on the resurrection, but it's tricky. You have to ask a lot of questions because some progressive Christians like Richard Rohr, who we're gonna address in a moment, will say that they do believe in a physical resurrection. But if you ask more questions, you realize that what Rohr means is something like Jesus' body going into the earth, you know, becoming, a, you know, nourishing a tree and, and there's like beams of light and things like this. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about Jesus' dead body coming back to life. And if you don't believe that, you're not practicing Christianity. I know that that's, might sound harsh, but Jesus' physical resurrection is a bedrock, non-negotiable belief of Christianity. But again, if you don't have a physical resurrection, you don't have a physical ascension, you don't have a physical second coming. So those things become metaphors. And then of course, as I mentioned last night, most progressive Christians do not believe in a place of punishment in the afterlife called hell. So they're very universalistic in that belief. So I wanna take you to an actual progressive Christian website. I pulled this off their website in reference to the gospel and they said, the good news is that you are inherently united with God. That's it, that's the good news for the progressive Christian. You just need to realize your belovedness. But friends, the stakes are so high. As I mentioned in the beginning, if Jesus' physical body didn't come out of the grave, if all we have to do is just realize that we're inherently united with God, then what about sin? What about all the great evil? There will be no justice for evil. You know, sometimes, have you noticed, there's not justice here on earth? There will be, because God is just, and his justice and his righteousness, in fact, that's what his wrath is. It's his controlled righteous judgment against anything that falls short of his perfect nature and character. And we should be very thankful for God's wrath because it's how he keeps his promise to wipe away every tear from our eye. The thing is, is that we get a choice. We get to choose to be under God's wrath or to receive his free gift of forgiveness and salvation. Isn't that wonderful? It's wonderful to know that every sin will be accounted for, every great evil will be accounted for, but also everybody has a choice. You can receive the punishment for, that, for your personal sins, or you can choose mercy, and you can choose to say, I'm gonna let Jesus take the wrath of God for me and, and bear my punishment. But I wanna give you, in the time we have left, just a few practical things to see, and again, you know, a question for your progressive friend and all of these things is what did Jesus think about these things? But I wanna take you to, remember DC Talk, any like 90s, 90s people? What would, remember Jesus Freak, what would people think when they hear that I'm a Jesus? I love that song, it was like icon. Well, one of the singers of DC Talk went on Twitter a couple years ago and talked about his deconstruction. And his progressive, you know, he's progressing, he's reconstructing, deconstructing, and people were confused. So he clarified and he said, I still follow the universal Christ. Now, a lot of Christians were like, okay, so he's following the universal Christ, I guess that's good, but what he was talking about is someone called Richard Rohr. Now, if you have progressive friends, if you have friends who are in deconstruction, you're gonna need to understand what Richard Rohr teaches because it's very influential in progressive Christianity. And for Rohr, Jesus and Christ are two separate entities where the Christ is the logos, it's the explanation of all reality. And so for Rohr, he talks about the first incarnation being creation because he's a panentheist. Remember, we talked about that. God is in all, all is in God. That's Rohr's view. And so based on that view, he teaches people to look for the Christ within themselves. And he says, Jesus is a model and an example of the human and the divine perfectly cohabitating one body. But notice the word example. This is an example we can follow. In Rohr's view, all of us can imbibe this universal Christ. And by the way, in the new age, this is called the cosmic Christ. It's very, very similar. Here's a quote from Rohr. God loves things by becoming them. God loves things by uniting with them 
not by excluding them. Through the act of creation, God manifested the eternally outflowing divine presence into the physical and material world. Ordinary matter is the hiding place for spirit and thus the very body of God. And so on Rohr's view, I have quotes from him also saying that every creature, not just humans, but every creature is made in the image of God, which denigrates the, the, that kind of special creation that we know we are as human beings. But I wanna show you where this leads. I mentioned at the beginning that progressive Christianity will lead you to worship yourself. I wanna demonstrate this. How many of you remember the band Gunger? Remember, like we probably sang some of their songs in our churches and over the last couple of maybe 15 years or so, they've deconstructed and gone in different ways, but they're following Richard Rohr. And Michael Gunger went on Twitter a couple years ago and wrote this, Jesus was Christ, Buddha was Christ, Muhammad was Christ. Christ is a word for the universe seeing itself. You are Christ. We are the body of Christ. If that shocks you, good, it should, but it's built upon that panentheistic worldview. It's built upon the idea that all created matter has this divine essence, and this has become the dominant view of Christ in the progressive Christian church. And of course, Michael Gunger followed up, affirming that this is talking about Richard Rohr. But what was Jesus' view? Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Can't go through Buddha, you can't go through Muhammad, you can't go through your meditative practices or positive affirmations, you must go through Jesus. Jesus is not just an example of somebody who realized the universal Christ. You know, we all love John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, but we forget to keep reading John 3, 17 and 18. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, praise God, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Friends, We must believe and trust in Jesus Christ to be saved. You know, when Jesus talked about the gospel, he shared a lot of parables. And I encourage you to read some of these parables and notice how many of them end up with groups of people being separated at the end. Kind of the ins and the outs, right? We have the parable of the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins who brought oil for their lamps to make it into the wedding feast. So when the door closed and the ones who were foolish and had to go buy oil, they didn't make it in in time. But the door was shut. They didn't get to come in. We have in that same chapter, the parable of the sheep and the goats. Now the progressives think we're the goats, but that aside, it ends with a separation where the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Does this sound like somebody who just sort of embraced this universal Christ consciousness and just wants you to realize how beloved you are? No, Jesus' words are very clear about heaven and hell, and how we must trust in him. Again, because Christianity isn't like ice cream, it's based on Jesus. So I wanna give you three questions to even ask yourself perhaps, or to ask somebody in your life who might be struggling with some of these ideas. Here are the three questions. Number one, what do you think about what Jesus taught about the scriptures? That's a question we should all wrestle with. What do you think about what Jesus taught about the scriptures? And then go to the word of God and see how many times Jesus quotes or cites an Old Testament passage and calls it the word of God. Second question, what do you think about what Jesus taught about the cross? It's a question we all need to wrestle with, but it's a good one to ask our progressive friends. And finally, what do you think about what Jesus taught about the gospel? Because if we're Jesus followers, then our view of the Bible cross and the gospel should be what Jesus taught about those things. And in my analysis, in my study, progressive Christianity is a different religion because it worships a different God. It's a different Jesus. It's a Jesus who can 
understand you and stand in solidarity with you, but it's not a Jesus who can save you. And so, to end on a sobering note, let's follow the truth of who Jesus really is because the stakes are that high. Amen?